Hello, welcome to the music show on Radio National. I'm Andrew Ford. And later on today's music show, I'm going to be speaking to the pianist and composer Chris Cody about his new album, Astrolabe. It's a suite of music inspired by the voyages of La Perouse and the French ships that explored Australia and the Pacific in the late 18th century. They arrived, in fact, off the coast of New South Wales, around about the same time that the first fleet arrived. You're listening to The Music Show on RN. The journey of the French navigator La Perouse is an extraordinary tale, and it's inspired a new suite of music from the pianist and composer Chris Cody. Chris recently returned to Australia after 20 or so years living in France, and this music is really as much about that as it is about La Perouse. He's assembled a cast of jazz luminaries for this album, playing all of the sorts of instruments you might expect in a jazz ensemble, and a few more, like the conch shell and the ship's bell and Pacific log drums. We're going to hear the log drums now because they open this track, Pacifique. (laughs) 
That's the opening of a track called Pacifique, and it comes in the middle of a CD called Astrolabe. It's the work of Chris Cody. By the way, I should say that that was the uh, trombone, in case you need telling, of James Greening. It's a great pleasure to welcome Chris Cody to the music show. Hello, Chris. How are you? Hello. I'm very well, thank you. It's good to be here. We should probably start with the obvious question for a lot of people, which is what is an Astrolabe? An astrolabe was actually the, it's the name of both an instrument of measurement. It's basically a form of sextant. So it's the French word for sextant, but it was also the name of one of the two ships that La Perouse traveled around the world with on this, on his extraordinary expedition. Well, if it's a French boat, we should probably pronounce it in the French way in that case. You mentioned La Perouse. Tell us the whole story that that lies behind this. Well, it's an album. I would probably call it a suite. Is that fair enough? Yes, that's, that's quite fair. It's uh, made up of nine pieces. And I wanted to write a suite of music for larger ensemble. And I'd recently moved back from France after living in France for many years to here in Australia. So I was looking for some subject material. And we moved to the suburb of Maroubra in Sydney, which is by the sea, just up the road from another suburb called La Perouse on Botany Bay. And so I started reading about La Perouse, this uh, French navigator and explorer. And the more I read, the more I was hooked uh, and fascinated by his story. He'd been a commander of ships. He'd fought against the English uh, in the war of uh, the American War of Independence. He'd performed uh, admirably and notably for his actions, but also for his sense of moral uh, justice. And so he was eventually rewarded with this uh, by being named by Louis XVI to lead this expedition around the world. It in turn had been inspired, I think, by Cook's expeditions and other expeditions, but the various nations were putting these uh, seafaring uh, trips together to find out a bit more about the world. And what struck me about the French one was it was very much guided by the philosophy of the Age of Enlightenment. Uh, they didn't send, they sent a few soldiers aboard, but it was not about conquest or claiming lands. It was very much about expanding human knowledge, uh, meeting and discovering and learning about other cultures. So they sent a, aboard these two ships, uh, botanists, anthropologists, artists, a whole range of scientists, as well as cartographers, of course, to like improve existing maps. And they were also open to exploring the possibility of fur trade and whaling and so on. But they set off on this expedition that was to last four years or so, and they recorded language, music, how the people dressed, the peoples that they came across in these different lands around the world, how they lived, uh, whether it was from fishing, what their fishing boats were like, what cereals they might have planted. So I found the, the story in itself absolutely uh, fascinating and, and started writing some sort of ideas around some of the themes that emerged from this story about old world versus new, about the unknown, about setting off into the unknown, and eventually also about loss and disappearance because the expedition never made it back to France. And having moved back just myself from over 20 years in France to Australia, there were various personal resonances that I found uh, with the story as well. So as a composer, I found that there's plenty of material here to, to get my creative juices flowing. You are obviously a jazz pianist, and the musicians you're working with here on on this album are, you know, they have uh, magnificent jazz credentials, uh, James Greening not least among them, but Lloyd Swanton's playing bass, for example. And yet the music we heard at the beginning was obviously composed music, or most of it was, maybe not James's solo, but uh, that tricky... uh, irrational rhythm stuff is uh, not music that could be improvised. So perhaps you could talk a little bit about that process of composing this music. So when I wrote the whole suite, I wanted to write jazz because I was going to use jazz musicians, but I have a, my own background is classical. And I wanted to write, as I say, some music for a large ensemble that explored elements of jazz, but also classical writing and world music writing and, and playing. So I put together a a team of musicians that would be capable of reading well, because a lot of the music, as you've heard, is quite written, but also being able to improvise, but improvise uh, 
in a specific direction as well and not just leaving it up to chance. I'll just take a solo and it'll be fine. I wanted them to equally enter into the, the storytelling aspect of the music and the emotion that I was seeking to convey. So Pacific starts with that uh, uh, drum solo, which is a Pacific log drum solo played by Fabian Javier, then moves into a 7-4 canon, which was quite tricky to play and required more rehearsal than some of the other pieces. And then the B section is actually almost like a drunken waltz. And I, I was inspired to write this by the, his telling of the account of when they land in Samoa. And it started in such a friendly and happy way, and they were welcomed by the, the local people living there. But it ended with a skirmish where I think it was 12 of them were killed. So, again, this sort of both a happy and a sad ending, if you like, the, the, the meeting of, of cultures of at first uh, trust and then leading to, unfortunately, war and distrust. So I was trying to represent all of this in, in music, so, so that's why it's actually quite complex. But at the same time, I told the musicians to play it with a sense of, of abandon. You mentioned Samoa, Chris Cody. This is a, a, a moment, I think, to mention Père Receveur. Uh, if you go to Frenchman's Bay, you climb up the hill, you'll find his grave. He was on the mission with La Perouse and he was speared in Samoa and died when they got to the east coast of Australia and hence being buried there. But maybe you could tell us who he was because he was more than one thing, wasn't he? That's right. He was both a chaplain of, aboard the ship but also a scientist. And La Perouse put together this crew very carefully because a lot of people wanted to be part of it. And he wanted people that could operate on, on different levels and in different domains uh, and not just be one thing or the other. It's interesting, just uh, you, you mentioned Père Receveur, uh, as you say, who's buried at Frenchman's Cove. But one of the other people that applied to be on this expedition was Napoleon Bonaparte. None other than Napoleon, <laughs> who was a young military cadet just out of military school, and he'd specialised in artillery and maths, and he wanted to be on it because he had a he did have a passion for mathematics, and unfortunately he was knocked back. Uh, but it's a fascinating anecdote because if he'd been accepted, the whole history of Europe over the next twenty years would have turned out very differently. Well, especially if he'd been speared in Samoa. <laughs> That's right, and we we wouldn't have had all the Napoleonic uh, conquests, <laughs> uh, the expedition to Egypt. We wouldn't have had Waterloo, all those things. Yes, indeed. Let's listen to some of your music for uh, Père Receveur and uh, then we'll keep, continue to talk. <laughs> 
That's an extract from Père Receveur. That's uh, Father Receveur. Uh, it's about the, the uh, Franciscan priest uh, and chaplain who was also a naturalist on the La Perouse expedition who died uh, in 1788 on the expedition's arrival in Eastern Australia. The music is by Chris Cody, and it comes from his album Astrolabe, to give it its English pronunciation, or Astrolab, to call it after one of the ships uh, that La Perouse sailed on. And we hear there Tom Avgenikos trumpet, Paul Cutland playing bass clarinet, I think. Also in this ensemble, James Greening trombone, Susie Bishop violin, Emily Rose Sarkova on accordion, Lloyd Swanton double bass, Fabian Heavier percussion and ship bell, and uh, Chris Cody playing piano. And Chris Cody is my guest on today's music show. You mentioned earlier wanting to tell this story, this history in in music, and there's a bit of this going on at the moment, it seems to me. I mean, Lloyd Swanton himself has uh, written music in response to uh, more recent history uh, from the Second World War. Jeremy Rose has produced a, a lot of music based on historical themes. I wonder whether you've got any theories about this. That's an interesting question. I originally saw my own attempt to explore this historical theme, uh, as I was saying earlier, because I was living just up the road from La Perouse, looking for an an inspiration or a starting point to write a suite of music uh, that combined different styles for a large ensemble. In my case, I was very much thinking about Australian recent history and why is it as it is? And could it have been imagined differently? Could things have turned out differently? Another aspect is I'm, I also have two daughters who uh, have now started their education in Australia after having started in France, and I was very interested to see what they learnt in history at school. And unfortunately, I found that it was fairly simple and a little cliched. The recent history, the last 220 years I'm talking about, it was the old themes that I myself had studied at school many years earlier, that is the arrival of the First Fleet, Captain Cook, the arrival of the First Fleet, the Gold Rush, uh, Ned Kelly, and this is, you know, this we're talking primary school and, and uh, junior high school. And I thought, but there are so many other things in there that are absolutely fascinating that they don't ever hear about or study. For instance, the, the, the Dutch explorers that came here, the French explorers and navigators like La Perouse, you know, just to start on on those alone. Uh, If they do study the First World War, talking now about current events, why don't they go on and study about the Spanish influenza? There were so many forgotten stories that were incredibly uh, relevant at the time and touched thousands of lives that that seemed to be forgotten. And your interest in this fires off musical ideas. Are you in any meaningful way able to describe how that happens can you remember a moment in which a particular story in the la perouse uh, voyage voyages fired your musical imagination well as i say reading the diary yeah i found it immensely interesting and immediately inspiring when he talks at the very beginning of his diary that the age of enlightenment is, is almost over, but yet there are new countries to learn about, new discoveries to be made. I immediately related to that, which is why I wrote the very first piece of the suite, Mundus Vetus, which is Latin for old world, which is both, I guess, a, a good thing, but it might also be something that's holding back the world. And so from a musical point of view, that's why I wrote it in a slightly medieval style with, with fifths, uh, an ostinato, the choice of instruments. I was imagining a sort of a medieval village band with violin and accordion, and I heard plenty in the south of France where I used to go regularly that would play it at village fairs and so on. And musically, a lot of, you know, they'd be using shawms and and bagpipes and all sorts of instruments that musically still had a lot in common with their medieval forebears. So using the bass clarinet, again, is to capture that, that sense of mystery uh, and a slight dark aspect to it that the instrument conveys so well. The uh, Using the violin and the accordion to, to specifically tell the story of, of La Perouse, or at least my response to it. Uh, 
Again, that was also because those instruments would have been found on ships at the time and on expeditions. They were the sort of instruments you could take on board mm. and that would have been performed by the captain, perhaps, playing the violin, or equally by the crewman playing the accordion, probably be, would have been more lucky for them. So these were all sort of ideas that I thought, oh, I, yep, I can put this into the music. And even though it's, a, it's essentially jazz, it brings in other dimensions of classical, folk music, world music. So as I say, it, then the you know, departure, that was again trying to capture the sense of joy that they must have felt that was described in the diary by La Perouse. But I use a more jazz language there. I was actually sort of thinking in the bass riff, the beginning of the piece, and then the horns, which are fairly angular over the top of it. I was thinking of Ornette Coleman and some of his experiments in the 60s in free bop or the beginnings of free jazz and not being pinned down by, by conventional harmonies. Stone figures, I wanted to... Again, it was an emotional response initially about what they would have felt seeing the stone figures upon the Easter Island, the sense of awe and, and reverence, which he does describe again in the ship journal. And so I wanted a brass chorale with the instruments set a fair way apart from each other. So I've got open sevenths, so it's quite dissonant, to have a sense of tension as they discover set foot upon this island with its own indigenous inhabitants, of course, but also brass, because brass for me represents, it's almost religious, it's, it's that sense of, again, of awe and something slightly majestic, which then the theme then goes to, to violin and accordion for a softer alternate vision, if you like. Uh, so, they, they, yeah, these, should, should I go on? <laughs> these are just some of the <laughs> sort of like the, the inspirations for me, why I would write a certain way or what instruments I would choose. And the end, because we're going to listen to Espérance or Esperance. Well, Espérance which means hope. This is, for me, the point after which they've died. They've been shipwrecked upon the reefs at Vanakoro. Is it a sense of despair, total loss? I mean, it was 30 years before all of Europe were to find out what had actually happened to them. Uh, Louis XVI asked on his way to the scaffold after the French Revolution, is his famous last words, is there any news of Monsieur La Perouse? So Espérance, for me, was a sense of hope and continuation for the future. And I didn't just think of La Perouse because eventually his name has lived on. I was thinking also, again, very personally for myself, living in this new country of Australia, <laughs> the idea that knowledge and the quest for knowledge and, again, the seeking out and attempt at understanding other cultures and the improvement in relationship between cultures, that this would continue moving forward and growing. And, again, specifically related back to Australia, I was thinking about the indigenous people here in Australia and uh, about land rights, about a voice to parliament, about some of those issues that were in the news at the time when I was writing this music and that will hopefully resolve over the next years because I still see them as being unresolved and that there's this enormous uh, tension between modern white Australia and far more ancient and traditional uh, indigenous culture. So these were ideas that I was attempting to put in the music and leave it then up to the listener to hear what he or she will hear. But that's why I had, for instance, the didgeridoo throughout the suite as well as a little reminder of the indigenous voice and their view, whether it's on the Easter Islands or in Samoa or here in Australia, it was a, a metaphor, if you like, for these people that sometimes is forgotten in history as well, sadly, but their viewpoint of seeing the arrival of Europeans and what they must have also been thinking and feeling at the time. Chris Cody, thank you very much for being my guest on The Music Show. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, Andrew. It's been a pleasure to be a guest. That's Espérance, the track ending the album Astrolabe by Chris Cody. And I was speaking to Chris and the album's out and available now. That's it for today's music show. As ever, 
do go to our website you'll find all of the music details there and links and pictures and you can also catch up with past interviews too.